Hey everybody, this is Robbie with Robbie's Reptiles, and today we're going to be talking about reptile genetics. Now, I'm no expert by any means. I never claim to be. Over the past few years, I've gotten a pretty good rap around how reptile genetics work or genetics in general work and a very simple way to look at them. Consider this the layman's guide to reptile genetics. All reptile genetics, no matter what the gene is, have a 50% chance of passing on. So if you had a incomplete dominant gecko, let's say a lily white, the chances of lily white passing on are 50%, no matter what. Now, if you had a visual phantom or a visual exanthic, that would mean that there are two copies of the gene representing. Now, how come you have to really be specific about that when it comes to something that's recessive? Well, the only difference between a incomplete dominant gene and a recessive gene, incomplete dominant and dominant genes only need one copy of the gene in order to represent. This is great because it means that it's easily replicatable. You can outcross it much more and there's a lot less of a need for inbreeding. Recessive traits, however, require two copies of the same gene to be present. There can never be more than two copies of one gene present. Keep this in mind. A recessive trait needs two copies of the gene to be present in order to show the visual properties of that trait or gene. So incomplete dominant and dominant only need one copy to represent. Recessive needs two copies to represent, which means that when you pair a visual exanthic to a normal gecko, let's say, all of the babies will carry the gene and be what we deem 100% het. Really, this should just be heterozygous or het. A lily white as well is het lily white. Heterozygous simply means that whatever animal you're speaking of, in this case, crested geckos, a heterozygous crested gecko, let's say a heterozygous lily white, all that that's saying is that it has one copy of the gene. Now, through testing and research, we found that homozygous lily whites are lethal. They create a super form, which is when you have two copies of an incomplete dominant present, it creates a super form. And what's interesting is dominant genes do not have a super form, but we're not, we're getting ahead of ourselves. We have proven that a homozygous lily white is a lethal combo. So when you have two copies of lily white present, it results in a completely translucent or leucistic crested gecko. And for some reason, whenever there is a leucistic crested gecko, it seems to not be viable. And then we also see that with super cappuccinos. So that's two copies of the cappuccino trait, which is an incomplete dominant gene. When you have two copies of cappuccino, it leads to no crests, translucent skin, it's some form of leucism, and it's affecting the melanocytes in a way, so it is still darker, but it is pretty much translucent. And then sometimes they have eye issues where they develop a bunch of fluid, or they have poorly developed nostrils, or in some cases, no nostrils, but that's a lower percent to my knowledge. And then dominant traits, that's the really cool part in my opinion. I've never known this until the past few months. A dominant gene works exactly like an incomplete dominant gene, except for one major factor. With a dominant gene, you compare the heterozygous version to a normal, and then half the babies will be heterozygous for that dominant gene. So if you wanted to make the homozygous version, then you would get a heterozygous for this dominant trait and another heterozygous for this dominant trait gecko, pair them together, and all of them would kind of look the same, the ones that show the trait. So if you did a het to a het, then 25% of the offspring would be normal, 50% would be heterozygous for that dominant trait, and then 25% would be homozygous for that dominant trait. The problem is the homozygous version is indistinguishable from the heterozygous version. That is so interesting because we're familiar with lily whites, with cappuccinos. When you pair those, they create super forms when you pair them together and make something that is crazy different. And, you know, it's a super form. It's incredibly different than if you just had one single copy of the gene. But dominant traits, when you pair them together, have no super form. And that's really interesting. Does that mean that they're worth less? Depends on the gene, depends on the market value and what people are demanding at the time. I just think that that's really neat. Something like the Dalmatian gene that we have in crested geckos, it's proven to behave similar to incomplete dominant, but we don't know the difference between a heterozygous Dalmatian and a homozygous Dalmatian. Whether a crested gecko carries one Dalmatian spot or a hundred Dalmatian spots, what constitutes the homozygous version of that gene? We don't know. It might be dominant. So now the topic that I get the most. What is possible hets? Why are there 66% hets, 50% hets, 25% hets, and even lower? Now this circles back to what I stated in the beginning. 
When it comes to basic reptile genetics, dominant, incomplete dominant, and recessive, whenever you breed them, there's always going to be a 50% chance of that gene passing on to the offspring. And it's not like if you have six eggs, that means that three of them have to have it. Every single egg is going to have a 50% chance of representing that gene or carrying that gene. And then it's gonna happen again, and then again, and then again. So in order to get a 50% possible het exanthic, let's say, you would have to pair a head exanthic, which would be a single copy exanthic crested gecko, which would be a heterozygous or het exanthic crested gecko, which looks like a normal gecko. And you pair that to a normal gecko that does not carry the exanthic gene. All of the offspring are gonna have a 50% chance of being heterozygous for exanthism. The problem being a recessive trait needs two copies to represent. So we don't know which ones are the heterozygous ones and which ones are the normal. Half the babies aren't even gonna carry the gene and half of them will, but it can't represent unless there are two copies. So that's where we get into almost gambling, where you can buy a 50% possible het for a little bit more expensive than a normal and hopefully the odds are with you and you find out that it is heterozygous for exanthism by pairing it to, hopefully in the best case scenario, a visual exanthic, which is a homozygous exanthic crested gecko. By pairing a homozygous exanthic crested gecko to a possible heterozygous crested gecko, that's gonna give you the best odds of finding out if it is in fact heterozygous for exanthism. Because if you have all, let's say you have 10 babies from that pairing, if all of them are look normal, then you are probably safe to say that it wasn't het for exanthic but now you have nothing but 100% het for exanthics. It would be smart to pair it a second year in a row to just double check. Statistically, it's very possible for you to have paired a visual exanthic to a possible head exanthic, and maybe you just didn't hit the lottery on any of them. And it still might possibly be actually head exanthic, but since you can't see it, you can't tell. So I wouldn't write it off with only one season. I would breed it for two seasons, have more than 15 babies in order to fully declare whether it is a possible het or if it is not a het or if it is a het. So I've even seen a couple people posting something like 12% or 25% chance to be het exanthic. And that means that you got a possible het, impaired it to a possible het, and then didn't have any visual exanthics from that pairing. And then now you can say, oh, well, they're possibly this. So it's just kind of not recommended to do that practice. I can get if you're working on like 10 visual gene combos and one happens to be head exanthic or happens to be possible head exanthic. But if I were you, I wouldn't get into that territory. Focus on doing 100% hets getting 50% hets if you want to gamble a little bit, but mainly we should all strive to have a homozygous at some point to be able to prove out any possibles that we do create in the future. And finally, let's talk about something that is allelic. Now, to my understanding, an allelic gene, which we've now discovered is LUOC, which is when you pair a sable to a cappuccino, when you pair them, it creates something that looks like a super cappuccino, but it still has crests, and it just isn't, it's not 100% a super sable and it's not 100% a super cap. It's right in between. It looks just like them, but mixed together. Little Monsters has hypothesized from the evidence that we have that cappuccino and sable are in fact allelic traits. What does that mean? Because I know a lot of people met that with a lot of criticism. Allelic means they occupy the same location in the crested gecko's genome. So wherever the gene is that cappuccino makes all the differences in the melanin production and the color and the pattern and everything, sable is in the exact same spot. We don't know why, it just is. What is incredible about having genes that are allelic and occupy the same location in the genome, when you have a luwak, let's say, and you pair a luwak to a normal, you will only make cappuccinos or sables you won't make normals. There is no room for the normal to represent. It's like you have a homozygous version of a crested gecko, but it's still hetero for both sable and cappuccino. That is so fascinating. So you can see if this is getting your reptile breeding gears churning in your head, you can see the implementation and the use case scenario of having an allelic combo. When you have a luwak and you pair that to let's say really nice lily whites, the offspring can only be cappuccinos, sables, or frappuccinos and sable lily whites, which doesn't have a combo name yet. So I'm very excited for the future of that allelic combo. I think that that is going to play a vital role in 
all breeders' collections. Now, this is before any sort of research has come out. There aren't many of this combo, so we don't know if there's any sort of deficiencies like we see in super cappuccinos that is yet to be discovered as of the recording of this video but that's pretty much it sorry for the total info dump and word vomit i hope that this isn't go over your head watch this as many times as you want and still if you guys want any further clarification you can always reach out to me on instagram my email my website wherever you find me reach out and I'm happy to help. I do have a membership program with my YouTube channel where we go over things like business, genetics, and my breeding plans in the future. And you get me as a direct resource for advice when it comes to your pairings or your future breeding plans. But that's enough for this video. Make sure to like, subscribe, all that YouTube mumbo jumbo, and I'll see you guys in the next video.